these mics working? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. So, right, my name is Caroline and I'm a health educator with Kaiser. And when I say that, a lot of people will say, oh, which Kaiser do you work at? Mm -hmm. I actually am not housed at any of our numerous uh, medical centers or medical office buildings. Uh, I, I do have a, an office, more like a cubicle, uh, in the city of Santa Fe Springs. And, and I land there about two, three times a week. My job is to come to your job. This is what I do. I travel and I, I go to different locations. I work with different, uh, different groups of people, uh, always at the work site. So, so that, that's why I'm here. And, and, and I have a question for you. Why do you think it pays for Kaiser to hire someone like me and pay for my mileage <laughs> to travel all over LA and Orange County doing this kind of work? Why do you suppose it makes sense for them to pay my salary? Yeah. Oh, because you get the message out for different health things to many, many people. Yeah. And okay. Hopefully, preventative medicine. Preventative medicine. Yeah. Somebody else. Somebody else have a different okay. answer. <laughs> Sleep. Well, today's topic is sleep, so we'll we will dive into that a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, okay. So it's not a secret that Kaiser Permanente is an HMO. That's not a secret, and we we stay ahead by keeping most of our members as healthy as possible, so that they don't overutilize the services. So yeah, preventative health is a big deal for Kaiser. So that's why I'm here. Now. Why do you suppose that it makes sense for them to allocate a little space and a little time and a little technology for, for you all to be here? And I understand a little incentive too, depending on how many of these uh, little health programs you attend. Why, why does it make sense for UCI to carve out a little time in their tight budget for this, for you? Keep, keep the employees healthy and keep the costs down. Right. Who pays for your health coverage? Both, right? Everybody kicks in a little bit, yes? So does it cost more or less to insure a group of unhealthy employees? <laughs> more, right? Right? And it's all about the weakest link. This is what I like to say, you know, because they can't charge, oh, you are unhealthy, so you're going to pay more, and you are healthy, so you're going to pay less. Everybody has to pay the same across the board, right? So it's about the weakest link. Look around. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, so that's why you're here. So it's a, it's a win for Kaiser, a win for UCI, and hopefully you all are here because you have an interest in your own health. Who wants to be sick? <laughs> Nobody, right? All right. So hopefully I will motivate you to make a little bit of a change in your lifestyle. We are going to focus a bit on sleep, but any change is good. Any change is good, but change is hard. Right? Can we agree with that? Change is hard. I'm going to read something because I don't want to forget it. I want to make sure I say it right. This is about how difficult change is. Chapter 1. I walk down a street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter 2. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in this same place. But it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. But my eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter 4. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5. I walk down a different street. 
Doesn't the answer seem obvious, right? How many of you, because I know it happens to me, how many of you on your way to work, on your way to church, on your way to the market, on the way to pick up your kids, there's a hole, a pothole in the street, and you hit it every time. Does that happen? I'm sure it does. And why don't we go around the block? Because it's a habit. We do the same thing the same way all the time. It's hard to change. But as I mentioned earlier, as Courtney mentioned earlier, I've been a health educator for a really long time. And I've learned something, that if nothing changes, nothing changes. Does that make sense? So I can stand up here and talk all day, and you can sit there and listen. But if you don't take it upon yourself to make a little baby step forward, nothing will be different. You will have the same stress. You will have the same blood pressure. You will have the same weight. You will have the same sleep. You will have the same whatever. It's not going to change, <coughs> except for tomorrow, when you wake up, you'll be one day older. And things just a little harder, right? If we're lucky, we wake up tomorrow, and we're one day older. So, bit of an intro there. What's on my agenda today? Uh, why is sleep important? We'll talk about that. Some sleep problems. So there's some very real medical problems that I'm, I'm going to go over some information. And some very practical things. Some things that maybe are not new. Maybe you've heard these things before. But I'm not just here to give you information. I'm here, hopefully, to give you motivation and a way of maybe taking those little baby steps forward. Some resources, I am from Kaiser Permanente, so I do have some Kaiser resources, but also some community resources. And um, your action plan. So again, this is where those baby steps come in. What is it that you are going to do different? If you want better sleep, what is it that you're going to do different? You have to do something or things stay the same. So I like to, to, first of all, did everybody feel those earthquakes we had? Yeah. No? A couple weeks ago, maybe about a month ago. Yeah. You forgot already, right? <laughs> In Southern California, we have earthquake. Okay? And so our construction of our homes, of our buildings, is all to withstand earthquake. Foundations are built to withstand earthquake. So what if your house gets these little cracks in the foundation when you have these little earthquakes, you know, 3.2 out in Big Bear somewhere, and you didn't even feel it, but you got cracks in your foundation from it. What happens when we get the big one? What hope do you have that your building will stand? Not very much, right? It's going to crumble. It's going to sustain some damage. So I like to say that we have a health foundation also. And you can see that healthy sleep, adequate sleep, is up there. It's one of those things that is just as important as good food choices, as physical activity, uh, time management, having a support network. All of these things are what help us to maintain our healthy foundation. But what happens? is that when we have a little stress, we have some obstacles, we have some things that get in our way, we start to get little cracks in our foundation. I'll tell you a very quick true story. My mother's friend. My mom's friend is 80 years old, and recently her husband died. Very sad. He was sick for some time before he died. He was, he was ill, and she was worried about taking care of him. So she wasn't eating well. <coughs> She wasn't sleeping well. She wasn't worried about her medications or her exercise. Or she wasn't worried about herself. She was worried about him. And then he passed, and it was very sad, and she was grieving. So she still was not eating well or sleeping well or taking care of herself. 
One day this lady trips in the middle of the night on the way to the bathroom and guess what? Breaks her hip. And you know that she could not have surgery for about four days because she was so severely anemic. So this poor thing laid in the hospital bed for four days getting blood transfusions to get her blood counts up so that she could sustain a, a surgery for, to repair her hip. She had a big earthquake, but before her big earthquake, she had all these little cracks in her foundation with these smaller things. She wasn't taking care of herself. And unfortunately, she had a big one. Fortunately, she survived and she's fine and she's doing much better now. But just to show that we need to shore up our foundation because we don't know when the big one is going to hit. We're not statistics. I'm not a statistic. You're not a statistic. But these statistics, for me, are very powerful. These are the four leading causes of death in this country. Heart disease continues to be the number one leading cause of death by disease in this country. I've been an educator for 25 years. That has not changed. Why hasn't it changed? Why can't we do something about heart disease? Because it involves lifestyle. So eight out of 10 cases of heart disease can be prevented with changes in lifestyle. Nine out of 10 cases of diabetes, which contributes to heart disease, can be prevented with lifestyle. Stroke and cancer, some people are surprised, cancer, seven out of 10 cases of each of cancer and or stroke can be prevented with changes in lifestyle. Oh, it runs in my family. Yeah, it's like playing poker. You know, we can't control the cards that were dealt, but we can control how they're played. Right? So, I don't know. Maybe that motivates you a little bit. <laughs> so why is sleeping important to you? Tell me, why is sleep important? Yes. Recovery time? Okay. What else? Weight. It's harder to lose weight if you don't have sleep. Absolutely. Did you all know that? It's harder to control your metabolism. It's harder to lose weight when you don't sleep well. What else? What else? That's it? That's it? The, way you <laughs> the way you feel. Right. Right. I'm sorry, you said You're something? Just being able to function. Yeah, function. <laughs> function. Yeah to not be a zombie, zombie during the day. All right. Yeah, so um, if we don't sleep, of course, we suffer from daytime sleepiness. Uh, impaired um, memory. That's not good. Let me get all of these up here. Yeah, so uh, difficulty concentrating, depression, slow thinking, irritability, erratic behavior, all of these are symptoms of sleep deprivation. So very important for us at work, right? We don't want to be grumpy with our coworkers and the, the people that we, that we deal with. We, we don't want to be uh, slow thinking. We don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to forget things. You have a list of, who, who here is busy, right? Aren't we busy? We have about 100 things to do. And what if you make a mistake or you forget something on half of those things? You have to go back and do it over again, correct those mistakes. And, and not, not having enough sleep definitely contributes to that. Oh, poor health. I'm sorry. Yes, poor health. So rapid eye movement. I'm not going to get into a whole discussion of, of dreams and rapid eye movement and all that. But basically, REM, or rapid eye movement, this is where, of course, you see somebody asleep and their eyes are closed, but you can see their eyeballs behind the eyelid or moving back and forth. Um, this is a dream state. This deep, deep level of sleep is where we produce something known as growth hormone. And growth hormone sounds like it's for little kids to help them grow. And, and that's true. 
You ever notice a small child? Who here has children? Yeah. My, daughter, my daughter's going to be 11 next week. And I all, can always tell when she's going to go through a growth spurt because she sleeps a lot. She sleeps a lot. So she's growing. Tell her it's good that you're sleeping, baby. It means you're growing. It's good. Now, grown-ups, we're not growing so much anymore, right? <laughs> we're not growing. But we still need to heal. We still need to repair. If we're sick, if we have the flu, what do they tell you to do? Get some rest. Get some sleep. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is during these phases of sleep that this growth hormone kicks out and repairs those damaged tissues, replaces the old dying tissues. So this is how we, we can uh, stay healthy. This is how we can um, recuperate from just the day, not necessarily being sick. It, it's also how we maintain metabolism, right? Also, it seems that human growth hormone is related to insulin resistance. So back to diabetes seems that, mo that a lot of people who are having trouble uh, sleeping, a lot of people who have uh, problems with hormone secretion, insulin is a hormone, human growth hormone may be related. So some of the studies are telling us. So what gets in the way of good sleep for you? Yes? Taking the dog out. Taking the dog out in the middle of the night. Okay. What else? What else interrupts your sleep? Stress. Stress. Worry. Worry. What else? Pain. Pain. What else? Yes, sir. Being overweight. Being overweight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I will mention that a little further. Yes. That's a that's a big deal. Too much light. Mm hmm. Anybody else have something different? Temperature. The temperature? Oh, yeah. Yeah, loud neighbors. Noise, yeah, noisy neighbors. Noisy neighbors, yeah. <laughs> Your husband snoring, yes. Back here. Did you? Yeah. Insomnia? Yeah, insomnia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Caffeine. Caffeine, okay. Well, you guys know all the answers. Yeah. Yeah, you guys know the answers. You guys know. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes it's pain, it's a headache, it's a backache, um, arthritis, different, different uh, medical conditions um, can contribute to pain. Um, you know, stress, work stress, home stress, um, it, uh, uh, relationship problems, relationship issues, either between spouses or between, you know, parent and child, you know, sometimes not your child, but your parent. Uh, so so a, lot of, a lot of issues can be contributing to our not being able to sleep, the environment, um, you know, whether it's noisy or too light or too cold or, you know, th all these things get in the way. Some of these things are things that we can control for. Some of these things are a little harder to control for, but most of the time there's, there's ways around it. We just have to be a little bit creative sometimes. And I think sometimes we don't put the effort into it because we say, oh, it's, you know, it's just sleep. But sleep is an important thing. It's like eating well. It's like exercising. It's, it's one of those things that is helpful in maintaining our health. So maybe we need to invest in some drapes that, you know, black out the light. Maybe we need to invest in a doggy door. Maybe we need to invest in some earplugs. Maybe we need to invest in, you know, a room addition so that, you know, you can have his and hers bedrooms. Maybe you need to, I don't know how much you want to go into it, but it's certainly worth uh, brainstorming some ideas. Now, here's the thing, and I think sometimes we get into a pattern of not being able to sleep, and then you're tired, and then you're worried about not sleeping, and then that causes you more worry, and so that causes you more insomnia, and it just spirals down. Have you ever gone through a day where you didn't eat?
Has it happened? Maybe you were so busy, maybe you were sick, maybe you were fasting for religious purposes, maybe you went through a whole day and you didn't eat. That's not good to do every day. And you were probably hungry and tired and, and not and grumpy and not feeling great. But you survived. One day of not eating. It's not very comfortable. But you survived. We need to eat. We need to drink. We need to have liquids. We need to hydrate. We need to sleep. But if we don't eat one day, we'll survive. If we don't sleep one night, we will survive. We'll be tired and we'll be grumpy and we may be forgetful. But one or two bad nights is okay. So let me put that in perspective. However, if this is something that is happening on an ongoing basis, just like not eating often <laughs> is detrimental to your health, just like not drinking enough water is detrimental to your health, not sleeping on a regular basis can become detrimental to your health. But I don't want anybody to be stressed because they can't sleep one or two nights and then that stress causes them to sleep another one or two nights. So that's the good news. All right. So I, I want to very briefly cover some information on short-term insomnia, long-term insomnia, and sleep apnea. Okay? So these are the, the, leading, the leading sleep problems. Insomnia can be defined as um, either sleep onset or sleep main maintenance or sleep maintained. So insomnia can be that you have trouble falling asleep or you fall asleep okay, but you just have trouble staying asleep. Okay, you wake up often, and, and then it's tough to get back to sleep. So the short-term insomnia, this is what is the most common. And this is usually related to some very temporary stressors. This is where your child is sick and is coughing all night, and you're up and you're worried and you're checking their temperature. This is where you are you know, going to be leaving for a, a long trip tomorrow and uh, you're, you're nervous about making it to the airport on time and did I pack enough sunscreen and you know all of those things you're worried about. This is where the holidays are coming and you're going to have a house full of relatives that you only like half of them and so this is the short term insomnia is short term. It's one or two days, it's very temporary, it's very common and we will survive. The long-term insomnia is a little bit more complicated. This is where we have pain, and that pain can be related to another underlying medical problem. It can be related to arthritis. It can be chronic back pain. It can be fibromyalgia. It can be, it can be uh, prostate problems in men. It can be uncontrolled diabetes, and you have to get up several times in the night to use the bathroom. It could be your medication, your diuretics, that are making you get up to use the bathroom. Could be many, many, many issues, and it's usually an underlying medical problem. So we need to look at that, say, well, we need to control the diabetes better, and that's going to help us sleep. We need to control the blood pressure better, maybe reduce the medication, that's going to help us sleep. So this is what we need to maybe explore. So is it long-term insomnia? Is it short-term insomnia? Is this a temporary stressor? Doesn't mean that things can't overlap. We're not limited to one medical problem per person, right? Sometimes we have two or three or 10 different things going on in the same body. So sometimes we can have arthritis, and most of the time it's OK, and maybe you got a little pain and it makes it somewhat difficult to sleep. But if tomorrow you're going on a trip, that may be just one more layer. Sleep apnea is, can be, a very serious medical problem also. And apnea means without breath. So sleep apnea means that you're sleeping without breathing, without breathing properly. And of course, um, we, we remember you know, old movies and old commercials, um, um, comics, where 
where you know the person is snoring and it's and it's so funny that they're snoring, and you know the wife elbows him and 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 it's and it's a big joke, but it can be very very serious. That moment where that person is snoring is is good because you know they're breathing. Ex there's an exchange of air. That moment where they stop snoring, it's because they've stopped breathing. That's not good. That's not good. We need to breathe. So some symptoms of sleep apnea can include heavy snoring, okay, and especially where you stop snoring and then the person is gasping for air. Many times these symptoms are unknown to the person, but they are known to the person that loves them laying next to them. Uh, dry mouth, of course if you're snoring, you're breathing with your mouth, so that dries out your mouth more. Uh, morning headaches, if you don't have enough oxygen, that will give you a headache. And um, excessive sleepiness, of course, and frequent, frequent nighttime waking. So that gasping for air causes you to, to wake up. Your body wakes you up. It's a defense mechanism. You need to wake up and breathe. Um, you know, when we're asleep, our body relaxes. And those tissues in your throat relax. And sometimes they relax too much. And this is especially common in people who are older, people who are overweight, and people who do not play the didgeridoo. There's actually studies that, um, that show that playing the didger, didger, didgeridoo, didgeridoo um, help strengthen those throat muscles um, to improve sleep apnea. So I don't know if we can all play the didgeridoo, but um, does anybody play a, a wind instrument? You know, that may have a similar kind of effect. I don't know. It's just maybe worth investigating. Um, there is a test that can be done for sleep apnea. Um, they usually involve an overnight um, sleep study. Um, they're doing sleep studies at home where the person takes the equipment home and does a sleep study or the person can go to a sleep lab and have the sleep study done there. But um, that, can, that can be very revealing and um, um, very interesting results. Sometimes people are amazed that they stop breathing so often and for such a length of time. There's usually a spouse behind them saying, I told you. So some very practical tips. Now again, maybe these are things that you already knew, but maybe these are things that you need to develop an action plan around and say, okay, I'm going to do these things. I know that it's hurting my health. I know it's hurting my sleep. So maybe I need to just make an effort to make these changes. Uh, large meals late at night. High fat spicy foods. Okay, how do we avoid that? Caffeine. Now some people can drink caffeine at night in the evening and it has no effect on them. So obviously all of these things are, are issues that if you are having trouble <coughs> sleeping, these are things that you might want to correct. So caffeine within four to six hours of bedtime. Alcohol, this is interesting. A lot of people have, you know, a beer, a glass of wine at the end of the day and, you know, it helps them to relax. Well, it may help you to relax, but if you have excessive amounts of alcohol, it can really uh, play havoc with those uh, REM cycles, with those deep sleep cycles. Nicotine, some people like to smoke. They smoke and thinks, uh, they think that it relaxes them. Nicotine is actually a stimulant. So the person has the effect of being relaxed, however, what that means is that they're having a withdrawal symptom to the nicotine because it's been a period of time that they've not smoked and now they smoke so now they feel relaxed but it's because they're they're um, giving into that withdrawal uh, naps late in the afternoon now some people again will take a nap and it has no effect on their sleep at night fine take your naps but if you're finding that it is causing a problem with you sleeping, then maybe you want to eliminate that afternoon nap. Or at least keep it to less than, than a half hour, 15, 20 minutes. You may have to set an alarm. Uh, exercise within two hours of bedtime. Exercise is great. It's wonderful. Just not heavy, intense exercise too close to your bedtime because that actually will stimulate, stimulate you. And you'll want to come home and clean your house or do stuff. And, and, um, and not sleep. 
liquids, of course, two to three hours before bedtime. That's not a good thing because, of course, you'll be up at night uh, running to the bathroom. And then uh, some evidence related to screens. So computer screens, TV screens, even, even smartphone screens. Uh, it seems that the blue light is, uh, is a problem with uh, allowing your brain to, to shut down for the night. So get off of the screens. Some people like to read in bed. And when we had real books, you know, that, that might have been OK. <laughs> but now we all have Kindles or you know, something that we're reading with. And, and again, that's a screen that, that may emit the light. Uh, again, if you don't have trouble sleeping and you like to read in bed at night with your Kindle, that's probably fine. But if you're having trouble sleeping, then this may be something that you need to change. Okay. So do, do include a light snack. Not a heavy meal, a light snack. Something, so, something small. A bedtime routine. Again, those of us who are parents, know that if you have a small child and you allow them to run around and be crazy and then, yeah, it's bedtime, go to sleep, it's just not gonna happen. They need to shut down, they need to wind down. Sometimes adults, we need to do that too. So a little relaxing bedtime routine. At my house for my daughter, okay, it's a bath and then a book and then a prayer and then sleep. And we're out. And it's this little routine, and it takes an hour. It takes an hour to, sh to shut her down. Right. So you may not need an hour, but you might need 15 minutes of some light stretching or yoga or warm bath or something along those lines. Exercise earlier in the day, as I mentioned, and a cool, dark, quiet room. Again, this is where we may need to invest in some blackout drapes, in some earplugs, in a fan for some white noise, something like that. Um, the temperature, the optimal temperature, is about 65 to 70 degrees for, for sleep. Yes? Yeah, actually, this, this is coming. Thank you. There we go. Good sleep foods. I was reading your mind. <laughs> it's a talent. No. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, we think of turkey when we think of, you know, tryptophan foods. Uh, and, and turkey is still fine. It's still fine. Um, but dairy also is good. So that warm milk that, that grandma used to recommend, that's, that's still fine. That still works. Uh, nuts and seeds are good. Bananas are good. Something with a little honey on it. Maybe a piece of toast with a little honey on it. Eggs, surprisingly. So maybe a hard-boiled egg in a warm glass of milk. That will be a nice little snack before you go to bed. Um, milk and cereal. So the carbs actually complement the dairy. So I'm not talking a big bowl of cereal, just a little bowl of cereal, half a cup of, of something, you know, low fat, low sugar, like Cheerios or something like that. Um, cheese and crackers. So those are some, some examples of what a, a light bedtime snack would, would look like. Okay, so thank you. Tells me you were awake and paying attention. <laughs> okay, so relaxation and sleep. How do you relax? What is it that, uh, that you all do to help you relax? Meditate. Meditate. What else? Garden. Gardening. Yes. Reading. Reading. What else? Stretching. Stretching. That's it? That's all you're relaxing? Listen to music. I was waiting for that one. Listening to music. Deep breathing. Deep breathing. Watch TV. Watch TV. As long as you're not watching something scary or, you know, the news, which is like watching something scary. Uh, <laughs> depends on what you watch, right? Yeah. So we need to maybe develop that bedtime routine that I talked about. Um, how many of you get to the end of your day and you go to bed because it's late, not because you're done? <laughs> right? Did I mention my daughter was 10? So yeah, I don't have enough stress in my life, so I have two dogs and a daughter. And yeah. So it's hard to relax. And you lay down in bed because it's late 
not because you're done. And sometimes your head is still going over all the things that you left undone. How many times do you actually get out of bed to go do something because otherwise you're not going to be able to sleep? Picture day tomorrow? Is she packing a lunch? <gasps> Did I feed the dog? Yeah. So, you know, these little things that go on in your head. Sometimes we don't relax. We turn off our computer and our computer goes through its own little thing to shut itself down and we don't allow ourselves the same, the same luxury. So, relaxation, uh, some of you already mentioned this, uh, reading, a warm bath, um, light stretching or something like yoga, prayer, meditation, some calming music, some deep breathing, belly breathing, visualization, uh, progressive muscle relaxation. Um, is, is everyone familiar with progressive muscle relaxation? No, we're, we're actually, I'm actually going to lead you through a little bit of that. Um, I want to leave you with a couple of tools and um, Sometimes I, I do work with, um, with trade groups, uh, trade uh, uh, members, so carpenters and electricians and things like that, and I talk about the toolbox. You know, sometimes you, you, know, you use your favorite tool all the time, you know, you have a little multi-purpose MacGyver tool that has, you know, the little knife and the little screwdriver and the little scissors, and sometimes you need to bring out something else. So, you may enjoy meditation, or you may enjoy some light stretching, or you may enjoy reading, and this may be your go-to tool, the thing that you like to do or that you do. But sometimes we may need to rummage through the toolbox and see what else we can pull out. So I hope to share with you a couple of things. Deep breathing. Deep breathing is a nice tool because you can do it in 30 seconds. Sometimes you're on the phone, you're having a difficult conversation, it's causing you some stress, and what do you do? Well, you can't take a break at that moment, but you can do some deep breathing, and that may diffuse the situation a little bit. Okay. Visualization, this is where we imagine ourselves being successful at whatever it is that we planned to do. And progressive muscle relaxation is where we take one muscle group at a time, and we relax. We, we tighten it, we contract the muscle, and then we relax the muscle. And if we do one, group, one muscle group at a time, starting with the feet and work your way up to your head, by the end of it, you should be completely relaxed. Just like any exercise that we do, the more you do it, the better you get at it. So if you've never done it before, you may feel kind of silly doing it at first. But the more you do it, the better you get at it, and your body recognizes that, oh, there she is. She's going to be, you know, tightening her toes. That must mean we're getting ready to relax. And it sends the message to your brain much quicker, much more quickly. So everybody, if you want to do this with me, we start with some deep breathing. So put your hand on, on your belly, one hand on your belly, one hand on your chest. And I know we always walking around holding our tummies in. Let's forget about that right now. So when you take a deep breath, we want to inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth as if you're blowing out birthday candles. So one, two, three, inhale. Ready? In and out through the mouth. And one more time, in and out. And you know when it's your birthday, you have more candles every year, and you don't get your wish unless you blow them all out. It gets harder and harder every year. So you pull air from somewhere. You don't even know where you had this air, but you pull it out so you can blow out those candles. So that's what we want to do. We want to take that air that's deep, deep locked into the bottom part of the lungs and get that out. Because if we empty the lungs, now we can take a deeper breath, next breath. So try that again. And exhale, and keep blowing out, and inhale again. Sometimes you can feel that that second breath is, you can go a little deeper. So keep your eyes closed, keep breathing, and imagine yourself, 
an eight or nine year old version of you. Imagine what it's like to be a child. Imagine that you're on the swings. Imagine that you are getting higher and higher on that swing. There's a tree growing by the swings and you want to try to make your feet touch the leaves on that tree. It's a game you used to play. And as you're enjoying the rhythm of the swings, you're thinking to yourself, there's nothing better than being a kid on a swing. Except, maybe, being a grown-up on vacation. So jump off the swing and land yourself in your very favorite vacation spot. Maybe this is some place you've been to before. Maybe it's some place you'd like to visit someday. But in this place, you can imagine what it looks like, what it feels like, what it smells like, do you smell the ocean? Or do you smell the pine trees? Or do you smell the flowers? And this is a place that's calm and safe and relaxing. And this is a place that you can come to when you have a minute or two or three or five. You can stay as long as you like or you can just stay a short time. Think about the muscles in your feet, in your toes, in your calves. Take your feet and flex them up so that your toes are pointing to your knees. And tighten these muscles. Tighten your calf muscles, your toes. Hold it for a second. And then relax. Now take your knees and pull them together. Tighten the thigh muscles all the way up to your butt. And squeeze these muscles tight. Hold it for a few seconds. And now relax. Think about the muscles in your abdomen and in your chest. Tighten these muscles by contracting your abdominal muscles, tightening your chest muscles. When you tighten these muscles, it's, it's even difficult to breathe. So relax. Take a deep breath. Take your shoulder blades and make them touch each other. Pull your shoulders up toward your ears. Keep these muscles tight. and relax. Your shoulders and your neck is where you hold a lot of tension sometimes. Now think about your face. Tighten your eyes. Wrinkle your nose. Clench your jaw. Keep these muscles tight. And now relax. Take a deep breath. So now you've gone from your toes to your head. You can do this in reverse if you'd like. You can open your eyes. There are CDs that you can purchase that have a similar type of exercise. You can do it yourself. This is an exercise that you can do at night when you're lying there trying to get some sleep. When you get to your face and you're not asleep, start again with your toes. I know that some of you have to leave. I'm going to ask if you are able to Fill out the evaluation that I have uh, for you and leave it on the table before you exit.
I would appreciate that. I want to just share with you some, some resources that are available. If you are a Kaiser member or you're not a Kaiser member, you can go on to kp.org. And if you are not a Kaiser member, a lot of uh, general health and wellness information is available. There, sometimes online, it's difficult to discern whether something is a valid resource or not. And, um, and just know that Kaiser is always a valid resource for health and wellness information. If you are a Kaiser member and you log in with your Kaiser card number, of course, now you get some personal things, which are nice. Um, if you are a Kaiser member, this phone number, Wellness Coaching by Phone, is a benefit for you. It's not something that you need to make a co-payment for, but it is a, a coaching line. So if you are um, wanting to improve your health somehow, some way, you want to lose weight, you want to reduce your stress, you want to quit smoking, um, you can call and um, get in touch with a health educator on the coaching line. Okay. So think about those baby steps that you will do. Ran out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.